Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, coming to you today with a different kind of video. It's ship related, but also not ship related. I'll tell you what I mean. If you're anything like me and you're a bit of a Titanic nerd, you've probably been asked by all kinds of people about your opinion on the 1997 James Cameron epic blockbuster movie, Titanic. The people who ask this question are probably expecting some kind of strong reaction about how much you hate the movie. But uh, if you're anything like me, the truth is you kind of love it. There's a lot that I really like about this recreation of events, and one of those things is the absolute dedication to getting the look of the ship exactly right. But to do it was a lot of effort and money. This was kind of like a golden age of Hollywood, where practical sets were built on a budget of millions of dollars, and then graphical effects would be implemented to enhance what was actually built with human hands. And it resulted in movies that looked absolutely stunning. Titanic is one of them. So today, let's look at the insane engineering details behind the famous Titanic set from 1997. You've probably seen photos of the set being built and operated during the shooting of the film through 1995, 1996, but you may not be fully aware of just how much went into recreating the look of the ship. The set was built in Rosarito at Baja Studios in Mexico, and a lot of the set pieces are actually still there. The facility was built on a budget of $20 million at the time, and has been used to film a ton of films, including another one of my favourites, Master and Commander, and a huge replica of the ship, the HMS Surprise, is still there. They built the Titanic set on a 17 million gallon, 65 million, 300,000 litre water tank. Of course, you want the water tank to be as deep as possible so no one injures themselves if they're falling into the water, but you can't excavate a, you know, 40, 50 foot well across the entire area of this tank. So what they did was excavate a deeper well around the area where the Titanic set would be built so that then extras, when they were falling uh, from the ship itself during the sinking scenes, would be safe landing in water. But the rest of the tank, it was probably only about waist deep. And to mark the area where the water tank wasn't that deep, they placed dummies and debris and flotsam and jetsam just floating around. And if you keep an eye out in scenes of the movie, you can actually see some of those things just floating there. One oft repeated claim about the Titanic set is that it was a 90% scaled version of the real ship. And this is kind of true, but also kind of not. The height of the ship, the deck heights, and the scale of things in the vertical axis were one to one. Those are pretty accurate. But it's the length of the ship that they had to scale down. So to do it, they got visual consultant and historian Ken Marshall and his team to look at plans of the Titanic and photographs of the Titanic and figure out where they could take little slivers of the real ship and delete them all the way along and then stitch the ship together. And it worked really well. You can't really tell unless you really know what you're looking for, that there are whole sections of the Titanic that have been made to disappear so that the ship can be shortened in length. But if you look real close at the front of the ship, you'll see some cutouts for the first class promenade and the deck below on B deck. In real life, these cutouts sat practically on top of each other, but on the set of the film, they're spaced a little bit further apart. It's a very small detail. There are a few little clues like that that only nerds like me would pick up on. The ship's funnels were also scaled down, but they were still massive. I mean, they were sitting at the height of like a four or five story tall building. So they certainly gave the ship its look. One of the reasons they built the ship's set in Baja in Mexico, apart from the obvious financial benefits, was the fact that that stretch of coastline is fairly windy and the wind always blows in a predictable direction. Which meant when the set's funnels, which had smoke generators in them, were generating that smoke, they wouldn't need fans to blow the smoke in a convincing direction to make the ship look like it was at sea. It was simply the natural wind that would be blowing it the way they wanted it. One thing that was scaled down to fit were the ship's lifeboats. These were a little bit shorter than in real life as well, but they were very solidly built. While most of the set was really decorative and a bit of an illusion, one thing that was fully functional were the replica well and lifeboat davits. A davit is a kind of crane that ships use to lower lifeboats into the water. And Titanic used these new types of davits called the Wellen Quadrant Davit, so named after their inventor, Axel Wellen. Incredibly, the Wellen company still exists. They're an engineering firm, and they got the contract to build replica functional davits for the movie. But they actually had to really beef them up. Even though the real life Welland Davit could easily handle the ton or so weight of a ship's lifeboat, perhaps to ease confidence from the production team, they actually really heavily reinforced the Davits for the film. But regardless, when they had the weight of those replica lifeboats, which were still smaller and lighter than the real thing, loaded with extras and crew, swung out over the side of the ship, as they lowered the lifeboats down, the jerky motion of lowering the boats would still have the tops of the Davits bouncing up and down as they flexed under the weight. 
It actually gave Titanic historians a bit of an insight into the events of the real night because passengers at first were a little reluctant to get into the lifeboats and you can probably understand why when you see these lifeboats being swung out over the side of a 90 foot, you know, nine story, almost 30 meter drop straight down and the cranes that are meant to be lowering the boats are kind of jerking and bouncing up and down. The whole set was built on a steel frame with steel plates, they had decorative rivets, all kinds of decorative details to make it look like the real thing. Hundreds and hundreds of portholes and thousands of lights. There's about 3,000 light fixtures fed by 30 miles or 48 kilometers of cabling. It was determined there were about three times more practical light fixtures used on this set than on the real ship. In fact, James Cameron was installing more lights on the exterior of the ship than were there on the real thing so as to provide more even lighting for the actors and the events as they were taking place. A pretty famous example of this are the lights shining up on Titanic's funnels in the set. They weren't there in real life on the real thing. Those would have just been shrouded in darkness at night time. The ship set was built into five sections. I mentioned it was around about 750 feet long. You had the forwardmost section, which comprised the well deck and the ship's mast. The second section along, which was a pretty important section for the production, we'll get into that in a second. That had the forward two funnels. And there was a split right down the middle that led into the aftermost sections for the after two funnels. And then the last section, which was the ship's very stern, the poop deck. The reason they had to segment it and split it into these various sections was to actually sink the set. And here's how they did it. So the whole set was built on these support columns. As they wanted to tilt the whole thing down for those kind of long establishing shots showing the ship getting lower and lower in the water, they kept all the sections of the ship together and then kicked away some of the lower portions of those support columns so that when they were filming, the ship would be at the same angle and they could just keep it there while they shot those scenes. But then towards the end of the film, the Titanic's forwardmost section takes a plunge downward. So to do this, they had to reset, isolate the forwardmost section and have that sink. The second section with the two funnels was the part that all the action is focused on as Titanic is taking its final plunge. So that part of the set was built over a 40 foot or 12 meter deep well. There were green screens set up behind it so that the rest of the set wouldn't be picked up on camera. Then the support columns were got rid of and buoyancy blocks were put underneath so it would float for the most part, but then hydraulically actuated cables would be put into place so they could pull the entire set down. The buoyancy blocks would keep it from sinking to the bottom, but they weren't buoyant enough to prevent it from being pulled under by the cables. So they could control the speed at which that entire section of the ship slowly descended into the ocean, providing a very realistic looking and authentic sinking sequence because the thing was actually sinking. Everything behind that part of the Titanic set couldn't sink, so it was just kept in place. Contrary to popular belief, the interior sets like the Grand Staircase, the Dining Saloon, weren't actually on this set. This is totally separate, and this was only used for exterior shots. The interior sets were built on sound stages, in wells themselves, so they too could be slowly pulled under and have water dumped on them from above in the case of the Grand Staircase scene. What you may not know though is that the set actually collapsed at one point. One of the support legs kicked out and it meant the entire forward section of the ship suddenly dropped down into the well. They got an engineering firm to investigate and they had to drain the entire tank and just kind of check out what was going on. When they emptied it they found that a support leg had kicked out and the whole set had collapsed and there was some damage. The collapse was caused by a faulty weld and there were actually a couple of, uh, of bad welds on the set so they had to completely redo it and then they were able to continue filming. The other major exterior set piece was the very end of the ship at the stern. This was the ship's poop deck set and right at the very end of the film as Titanic's stern is being swung up into the air, this entire section of the ship could be separated from the rest of the set and then tilted up. And of course nowadays they would just film this on a small section of set against a green screen. But what they did back then, and it's incredible, was tilt this entire thing straight up into the air like 90 degrees and then have extras clinging on obviously supported with cables, but still clinging on as it was pointed straight up in the air. The thing was about 100 feet, say 30 meters or 10 stories tall. If you've ever been to the top of a 10 story building and looked down, yeah, that's kind of the height that these people were dealing with. It would have been terrifying. They had crash mats about a third of the way up to catch anyone if they fell. And the bottom of the entire well where the stern section was sitting was loaded with foam pads. All the major fixtures like the capstans and the bollards and things were just made out of foam. And in the scenes where the ship's sinking, you'd actually see them just bending a little bit when people actually hit them. In this photograph, you can actually see that it's been separated from the rest of the set. You can see just in the background there, there's the, the after part of the Titanic with one of the masts. This is the poop deck set has been brought over and put in this well for this scene. It's just insane. They don't make movies like this anymore. And it's a real shame they don't. I know this is a lot of effort, 
but it's so, so cool. It looks fantastic. It looks really, really authentic. I'm really scared of heights, so I don't know that I'd be able to have handled this. As for the rest of the shots of the ship, they used models. They had various scales of models. I think for the breakup, they had a 135th scale Titanic model. This is one of the things that I love about the film when people say, oh, I bet you don't like the movie Titanic. I have to say, well, yeah, I do, because it's the movie that can make this. Look like this. In my opinion, this was the golden age of Hollywood's visual effects. It was like the perfect blend of practical and computer. I'm not going to go into the models now because that's a fascinating topic and that's probably its own video. I will share this photograph though because it's really cool. This is 1996 and they were planning on how they would actually get the ship to break up at the end of the film. And they were testing getting huge segments of models and then how do you make it break up consistently for multiple takes. What they ended up doing was cladding the exterior of this model in lead plating so that it would slowly buckle as the weight of the ship really broke its back in real life. And if they didn't like the take, they could just apply the lead plating again, reset, and shoot it again. The results were incredible. All in all, it was a pretty incredible effort. It took teams of thousands of people to set up and shoot. And we haven't even gone into the fact that they rebuilt a replica of the city of Southampton and the wharfs right there just to film the departure scenes. That's a whole saga. That's probably worthy of its own video as well. But it's one of my favorite sets in cinema ever. It's not just because I'm a Titanic nerd, it's because the engineering and the patience and time required to actually achieve all of this and make it look that good on screen, truly remarkable. Well, there you go. I hope you've enjoyed me nerding out over this film. I know it's a little bit different to my usual content. If you enjoyed it, let me know what you think. Leave a comment. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. As always, stay safe, stay happy. And I'll see you again next time. And uh, maybe go watch Titanic again. <laughs>